everybody. Welcome to Mormonish. I'm Rebecca. And I'm Landon. And we have a guest that we are absolutely excited about today. We have one of our book club members, Spencer, who has agreed to come on and talk with us today. Hi, Spencer. How's it going? Hi. Good. How are we you? Are, we're good. We are so excited you're here with us today. Now, he has a pretty impressive bio. Usually, I just kind of paraphrase, but I wanted to make sure I covered everything. So I am actually going to uh, read his bio, if I can see it here. Yes. Okay. So hold on one second. And then we'll get started after I do that. So I guess I should have pulled it up ahead of time, shouldn't I? That would have been the thing to do. Here we go. Okay. All right. This is our amazing book club member, Spencer. So Spencer says uh, he is an accounting professor at the University of Illinois. He does laboratory research on financial accounting standards and has presented his work to the International Accounting Standards Board and Financial Accounting Standards Board as they develop GAAP, which I don't know what that is, but it sounds really important. <laughs> he has published work in top tier accounting journals, including the Accounting Review. He received his PhD from Indiana University. In terms of his relationship with the church, Spencer grew up in Utah County to goodly parents. He served a mission in Mexico and was in a bishopric in his, in his Illinois ward until 2018 while going through a faith transition. His records are still in the church and he has great associations with believing members, but stopped attending in 2019. He and his wife, Stacy have three wonderful children under the age of 10. So this is Spencer. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me on. And it's GAP. It's U.S. GAP. So is it GAP? Uh, I know. I, yeah. I read the acronym because I thought. <laughs> general accounting, uh, general accepted accounting principles. Not as cool or helpful for people as, uh, you know, especially outside of the accounting area. But I uh, think it's cool. <laughs> it's cool. And I'm sure some of our viewers will be equally impressed. So, but amazingly, we are not having Spencer on today to talk about really anything to do with accounting, although future episodes, uh, because there are accounting issues that Mormonish would like to delve into, if That's you know what true. I mean. <laughs> exactly. Sure. No, the reason Spencer is on today is because last month in the Good Book Club, um, which we are all a part of, we read this incredible book called How to Be Perfect, The Correct Answer to Every Moral Question by Michael Schur, who you may know, he is the creator of The Good Place. So this conversation with our book club was just so amazing. And Spencer was the presenter of the book. He not only suggested the book, he and his wife had read it, but then he led the discussion. And we just thought, we got to talk about this some more. It, it was just an amazing topic. We kept it to about two hours and 10 minutes in book club, but we still felt there was more to talk about. So we wanted to have Spencer come on to Mormonish and just kind of delve into some of the ethics and moral questions um, that a lot of us face. So first, I think we'd just like to say, Spencer, would you like to just introduce yourself a little bit? I read your formal bio, but uh, we can talk a little bit about you and your story, and then we'll delve into how to be perfect. I mean, I'm super boring. Um, unfortunately, that's as good as that I is not true. that's all I can that is come not up true. with. <laughs> no, I mean, I grew up in Utah County, just like your typical uh, Mormon guy, and and then uh, I went on a mission, came back, went through schooling, and we just we really liked living in the Midwest. My wife and I, we ended up in Indiana, and um, then moved only three hours west to Illinois. And we've been there ever since. And we're actually moving back to Indiana, as we talked about earlier, uh, in the summer. So I think we're going to be Midwest people for, for the foreseeable future. <laughs> you put um, down roots. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Yeah. That's great. Yep. So, so I mean, that's, uh, you know, I've got three wonderful kids, like, like you mentioned, and um, they take up a lot of my time. And other than that, I'm just doing accounting stuff. And whenever I try and talk to people about the accounting stuff I do, their eyes just kind of glaze over. So <laughs> I'm not going to kind of, you know, I'm not going to put you through that today. I Although I feel like there are a lot of issues, especially maybe in the post or nuanced Mormon community that have to do with accounting lately, that people are curious, things are in the news. So that's why I say at some point, Landon, don't you think it might be fun to have Spencer back on to talk about some of those kinds of things. Oh, because... Absolutely. I think I think a lot of our listeners, uh, that's a very uh, compelling issue as to, you know, how the church get all this money? Where's it going? Is it legal? All of those questions. But I think uh, the question we're talking about today, morals and ethics, is something that 
all of us, you know, when you when when your family finds out that you're leaving the church, you know, the first thing they say is, how are your kids going to have any morals? And that seems to be the first question that's asked, like, you know, 99.9% .9 of the world is not Mormon, but somehow, you know, they don't have any ethics because they're not raised Mormon. So uh, that's why this book is so was so fun was because it made you think, you know, it, it brings up a lot of moral questions, a lot of different things, di different ways to think about things that when we're raised in the church, we have a certain way that we know, oh, what well, you follow the prophet. That's how you know what's moral. But this this book uh, lets you know that, no, here, here's ways to think. Here's ways to to develop and know whether you're moral or not or to evaluate something, whether something's moral or not. So that that's what was so fun about the book. And we Spencer recommended that we watch The Good Place uh, along with reading the book. It, uh, it's what, three seasons long. Yeah. So we we watched uh, we watched that and it was a lot of fun. It, it was really fun to read it and watch at the same time because you saw the principles of the book reflected in the characters uh, in, in, the, in The Good Place. So it's really a fun book to read. He's really a good writer. So we're glad Spencer uh, rec recommended that to us. Yeah. And, and now uh, he gave a great presentation on some of the issues that come up in the book. And, and so hopefully he'll be able to share some of that with us today. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that that's kind of why we started reading the book, my wife and I, because, you know, we left the church. And and in some ways, I guess I bought into this idea that that without the church, you can't have any morals. It's uh, I felt a little unmoored for a little bit. And I think one of the nice things about the church that it provides is it's this nice, easy heuristic in terms of how to make decisions. Um, it can make it makes the decision making process easier. Um, however, as you kind of get into the book, you kind of realize that a lot of the things just because it makes it easier doesn't make it more uh, you know, effective. And uh, in some cases, it makes really difficult issues too easy. Yeah. It provides this easy answer that actually shouldn't be easy. And in other cases, it actually provides the wrong answer. This this decision making framework that the church provides. And and in some ways, I think, you know, my my ethical decision making growth ability uh, or sorry, ethical decision making ability was was sort of stunted throughout my life. And, and then it became really difficult leaving the church, trying to figure out how to make a decision. So deciding whether to move to Indiana or stay in Illinois, it's like, well, what does the church teach? You know, what do we do? Well, we go to the temple and we just pray about it, right? And then whatever we feel, even if things go terribly wrong, <laughs> it's okay. Because it was meant to be. It was meant to learn be. something you from that. <laughs> right. And so now I leave, you know, now that you're sort of out of that, you have to own your decisions and you have to, you know, it just weighs down on you a little bit. So I do think it's a little easier in some ways to have the decision making framework of the church, but um, at least in terms of your the burden that it feel that you feel. Um, so yeah, I, I actually I created a couple slides. I don't know if I could share. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Just you're to pretty, think you're about kind of the yeah. Uh, as I was thinking about this today, it says host disabled participant sharing. Sorry. Uh oh. Okay. I'll, I'll allow you to share here. Um, We've had some I'm issues with people sharing things at book club that they should. I've heard. Share. Yeah. I'm zooming in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so no, I, I think it's funny, and I think uh, you know when you're more on the other side of the church, how do you make decisions? I think some people think, oh, well, you must use a magic eight ball or a, a Ouija board. You know, not at all. You all of a sudden realize it's me, and I have to own that decision, whatever it is. And in a way, even if that decision doesn't work out, it's still yours and it's all you. There's no one else to blame and you don't have to look for a hidden meaning when things haven't gone right. To me, it's it's freeing in a lot of ways. Right. Yeah. Let's see. I, How do I... I? I agree. It makes you take ownership of of the decisions that you're making. Yeah. And and it's it's very freeing to know that you got to make that decision because I I know in the church when I left one of the one of the issues was uh you know the the uh, November 15 right. policy mm -hmm. and I'd sat and told my bishop I do not feel comfortable with this I don't agree with this and and he said well you know the lord this is the lord you just have to trust the lord you have to follow what the prophet says and you know we talked about it for quite a while and then uh that uh that was on Sunday and that next Wednesday 
they reversed the policy. <laughs> and so yeah. the bishop was there defending the, the, the and, and I'm like, well, wait, I, I felt that was wrong. And now it appears it was wrong. I made a decision and I felt good about the fact that, you know, it seemed like uh, it was backed up. <laughs> but how easy for the bishop, the decision was support the policy. And then when he was told not to support it anymore, the decision was, was made already. Made he already. Really yeah. didn't have That's to right. think about anything. That's exactly right. And and as you mentioned, like Landon, so sometimes there are like these levels of, it, you know, when you find out that the the top leadership of the church doesn't have a, a, a phone, that they have a direct line to God, you realize that they're going through the same process you are when they figure out, you know, what policies to make, decisions to make in their lives. Then you've actually sort of layered on additional complexity wherein any mistakes that they make then get trickled down to whatever decisions you make. And so you've sort of compounded your own decision-making issue without realizing it, right? But by just relegating and, and delegating to them all of your decisions, um, it can actually cause a lot of problems. If, 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 you know, if you go forward with the assumption, like if we could really assume that the, that the church was true and that they actually spoke one-on-one -on -one with God, I think it would be a great framework. You know, if God had the right answer to everything and then you just listen to the prophet. But the problem is, is it's pretty self-evident that that's not what's going on. And so, but, well, and it's you know, I thought funny it, that, that we're taught that we came here for free, free agency and to learn to, to choose for <laughs> ourselves, And yet then sure. you're told, do whatever the prophet says. Yeah, <laughs> right. when the prophet speaks, the decision is over. That's right. And then you run into the problem that different leaders at different times say different things. Even sometimes current leaders don't exactly agree. So who... Who do you base your decision on? It's exactly. it's not yourself. You're looking for all these external sources, and that can be absolutely confusing. You're kind of taught to ignore your inner compass, you know, or yeah. override it. Like Landon, his inner compass told him, I don't agree with this November 15th policy. And he was just, they were encouraged, just override that. Don't worry about it. Don't think about it. So I agree with you, Spencer, when you say that when you get on the other side of it, you're maybe not in tune with your inner compass or, or how you actually feel. You know, your intuition, you have to kind of grow into that, I think. Right. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, just some of these. Can you see the screen? Uh -huh. Yeah, it looks great. OK. Yeah, I just thought like these first four questions are things that that, you know, after I lost my testimony or, or went through my faith transition, these questions suddenly became really complex. And they were questions that were so, so simple as a member of the church, as a believing member of the church. Like, where do you put your money? Easy. 10% to the church right. plus a, you know, a generous past offering easy yep. answer. And let's say um, we also have our Mormonish is on just audio only. So maybe if we read the questions, then people that are just listening. Oh, I didn't realize that. Okay. Know, yeah. Isn't that okay, funny? We're a podcast. We, okay. and I just realized that too. We're trying to be better at it. Cause lots of times we're just kind of barreling ahead. And we had a conversation yesterday, like, yeah, a lot of people listen to our podcast. We need to not just go, isn't that great what we're looking at? You know, <laughs> <laughs> so we're trying to be better at it. I forgot no, that's to good. mention so, that ahead of time. So yeah, as we're talking, let's just let everyone know what the slides are about. Yeah. So like the first question, should I donate to charity? Um, how much should I donate? Where should I donate to? Um, the church provides that answer clear cut. Uh, I should pay tithing to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, 10% of my income. You know, you have a little bit of discretion there in terms of how to define 10%. We could get into that if you want to get into accounting. Um, you know, the second question is, should I stay or should I go? Should I continue with my church activity? Should I keep going to church every Sunday? Should I um, go on a mission? And I think after you, uh, you know, move forward with your faith transition, church activity can be a very sticky issue. Some people decide to stay at church and, and sort of try and affect change from within and, and be a nuanced sort of physically and mentally out person because of maybe some complexities that exist within their family. And it's a very complex issue. But if you're a believing, you know, according to the church, the decision is already made basically for you. You've made a covenant, you're going. Um, you've got to take the sacrament every week, right? Um, should I have children? I mean, the answer is provided for you by the church. It is a very complex issue in the real, in reality. Should I drink alcohol? Uh, you know, people's relationship with alcohol can be very personal. Um, but it's, it's sort of clear cut by the, uh, in terms of what the church provides. And then, so those four questions, those are four questions that are very easy according to the church's decision-making framework. 
a very difficult when you just strip that away. But then you have other questions. And, you know, I think you look at those questions and you think, man, it's kind of easy to be a member of the church. And it would be kind of nice to have something like that in your life. But then you look at other questions where the decision making framework of the church does not provide a good answer. Like, should I cut off the head of this unconscious man, steal his clothes, impersonate him and steal his property by kidnapping the person looking after that property? I mean, unequivocally, no. Right. Unequivocally. (laughs) We don't need a book. We don't need how to be perfect to tell us no. But the church's framework says that there are instances where you should defer, hold back any of those feelings of, of hesitancy and, and go ahead and do it? Or should I kill my own son if I'm hearing a voice telling me in my head that I should do so? Referring obviously to Abraham. Right. Another one where that's, uh, it should be an obvious no. And so it's a, it's a, um, it's a difficult, uh, it's a difficult decision-making framework to adopt. Uh, and I, I, you know, despite it making things easier, it also makes your decisions maybe poorer in a lot of ways. And so I think about, you know, the church's approach to a decision-making framework, and they just say, first of all, your decisions are super, super important. So you better make the right decision because it has eternal consequences, no pressure. Yeah. That decision you make at eight years old is good. You're, you're, you're tied to it for the rest of your life. Uh, yeah. (laughs) And, but then it also says, you know, just basically, you know, go ahead and like in your day to day kind of make decisions for yourself. But first of all, first and foremost, don't ever do anything that would go contrary to the teachings of the prophets. Accept God's answers. Your ways are not God's ways. So if it doesn't make sense to you to cut off a, a man's head, just do it anyway, because you're you don't understand the right the right way of things. And so it, it's really debilitating um for you to just kind of have your hands tied behind your back and you have to do whatever this authority figure tells you um i i I do think you know there is one scripture in the church that says study it out in your mind and then pray and see if your bosom burns um speaking about oliver cowdery i believe and in the translation process and i actually don't mind that i think you know the, the the bosom burning whatever but Studying it out in your mind, that's kind of a great idea, right? Think about it. Think about the implications. But we were never taught in church how to do that. We're not taught about the tools of how to study it out in our mind, what the study. There's no study tools given to us about what are the implications of my decision. And it would be really nice if, you know, the church kind of uh, emphasized that, I think. Nor are we told what to do if you feel that burning and it's contrary to what you're being taught in the church. Then what do you do? You keep praying and pondering until you get the correct (laughs) bosom burning. So, and, you know, I know people would say, well, we're not told to cut off anyone's head and we're not told to, but you know what? We're told inadvertently uh, to shun family members that may be LGBTQ. Do you know what I mean? There's all kinds of cases where you're kind of overriding what your natural instinct might be um, for this other purpose. And you may not even realize that you're doing it or you know, those terrible quotes about it's better to come home in a pine box. I mean, really, a parent would rather have their child not alive than have, you know, made some indiscretions according to the morals of, of what. So I think we we very much are still being told things that override what your normal morality would tell you to do. Right. And it might be as simple as don't uh, follow your own intuition in terms of who you're attracted to mm-hmm. or uh, things like that, right? And so your your own intuition is very much deferred and, and uh, debilitated and stunted, and you have to kind of just follow this this framework. And so it's very difficult. I mean, I, I look back at this and I think, man, it was so easy, it was so easy, but also really, really bad and really too simplistic, right? <laughs> it, it was binding. It 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 really made it so that you 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 didn't have choices because the choice was already made for you. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And I remember taking a philosophy class in in college, and I remember hating that class because it was so they were like trying to make things harder than they had to be, basically. And I remember I had to write essays in this class, and I kept basically citing the church, like, "No, listen, you've got it." You're you're worrying about whether something is good or bad and all these decisions. It's like, look, we all come with the light of Christ and we get this promptings from the spirit 
and the prophets there to lead us. Like literally, that's how I felt. Like even but this like, wasn't BYU, right? So that's no. probably in eight. Oh, this was in postgraduate. This was actually at UVU. So I didn't go to oh, BYU, UVU. For okay. My undergrad. Okay, that's so, a little more liberal. Yeah, I can see the professor going, oh. <laughs> it's a little bit more liberal, but I mean, not a much, little. right? Um, no, I think that my hard. professor wasn't a, a, wasn't a, a TBM. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I just felt like I hated that class because it was just like, why would you go through all of the effort to try and make a decision here or even like worry about it? It's like, this isn't our job here on this earth. Our job is to obey. Which is so ironic because as Landon just said, we, uh, I think beyond many other religions, we are here to learn, to be tested, to use our agency, to make mistakes and learn from them. Yet not really. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Yeah. The only way that we learn from them is to, is to figure out how to obey. Like that's the end conclusion. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so yeah, I mean, I think that that's one nice thing about the church's framework. It's very easy, but it's also uh, very difficult and you get these, it, this leads us to this book where I think it was really, really fun book uh, because it, you know, it, it simplified things. Uh, um, in terms of like, when I say simplified things, you leave the church and, and everything just seems like, so like, well, what am I supposed to do now? And you almost need to rebuild a lot of this decision-making framework for yourself. Like, what do, what do my feelings mean now? I don't know. I don't know what my feelings mean now that I don't really know if there's like an external spirit telling me what to do. And I don't have like some authority figure that speaks with God and and so it's nice to have something that's it's written really well for like just somebody who's not really familiar with philosophy or ethics. Uh, and it's very accessible. Very. Accessible. I think they named Highly it wrong. It, it should be philosophy and ethics for dummies because it was really <laughs> simplified and it, it was, was really yeah. easy to understand yep. something that normally, like you say, you take a philosophy class in college and you're like, oh, my gosh, this is so hard. And yet this was so simplified. It was it was awesome to. In college, you say, I can't understand it, right? <laughs> I had to make Inside a joke. joke so. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure you're, the listeners are going to have to read the book to figure yeah, out. Yeah, they're going to have to understand. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. So, But I think, you know, I look back to these questions that we asked, and, and then suddenly you're, it's so much more fulfilling to go through the process of trying to answer these questions for yourself. You feel in control of your life. You feel like you have, um, you know, you feel like, you're making a decision that's best for you and you start to think about the the impact of your decision on other people um, rather than just kind of saying, well, whatever the consequences are, I just have to obey. Yeah. And, you know, whatever they might be, you know, they could be like awful consequences. No, and, and we've so seen that. Again, November 15th, yeah. right? People weren't on board, but they had to pretend they were. And so many people suffered so many people for those years so right and, and yeah. you own who you became when you make decisions like that as opposed to just blindly following whatever yeah. you're told uh you became that person because of your decisions whether it's good or bad you you did it it was your decision it's easy now when you're out of the church to stand back and go oh i hated what the church did to me there or what how i acted because of that but then you you that's not you. You were following what you were taught. And, and so you you really weren't you. You were them. <laughs> in that yeah, case. right. And, I, you know, I, I think it's difficult to I look back at a lot of decisions that I made in the past and I, I it's really difficult to forgive myself. You know, I made some decisions that I look back and I think, but, you know, you're you're part of the system. You didn't know any better. Um but it's it, it's interesting how so many decisions that I've made, you know, whether it's on my mission or or elsewhere, where it's like I would have made obviously a very different decision. Um, it's just it's it's surprising how obvious the the right or wrong actually was. It's it's interesting because you know you thought you were doing something that was right because you were following the church, and it's interesting looking back and saying it was unequivocally wrong, unequivocally. Any any objective person would say that what you did was wrong, um, but you were under the impression that you were in the right. Um, so yeah, that's that's difficult. I don't know if you felt that way. If you've looked back at the decisions you've made and oh, yeah. 
evaluating it from the current, the new framework is it can make your past decisions just seem so uh, asinine, right? Well, you're you're also a lot more invested in it when you made the decision rather than when you're just following it. I, I think I I look at my mission. And, you know, I was out there, I was told I had to go. It was one of those check mark things and you're out there trying to do it. But I was never comfortable wearing the white shirt and the tag. And I didn't want to, I really wasn't a person who would just go up and say, oh, you need to read this book. But since I've been out and we've been part of this book club, I go up to all kinds of people and say, you really need to check this out. This is a lot of fun. We're reading a lot of good books. I'm invested in it because I made that decision and and it's something I want to do, not something someone told me I had to do. Right, exactly. Yeah, I think back to like my time as a bishop, Frick member, and I would go, uh, you know, I had to go up and sit up on the stand and I hated that. I absolutely hated it. I think it's so dumb. It's a dumb rule. It shouldn't exist. It puts men on the pedestal and your kids are down there and they're like struggling, you know, your wife, you see your wife your and she's wife, struggling. Yeah. <laughs> it's so dumb. It's not, it doesn't, it's unnecessary. It's an unnecessary rule. And if I was, you know, making my own decision about it, I would have said, no, thanks. But you just feel this pressure to like conform. Um, and so you go ahead and do it. And just like you landed with the mission, I just think I just, you just do it. You know, that's just, it, it's, it's an easy, just yes or no, you just follow. And, um, and even even though even though you have that kind of, you know, that that those gears grinding in the background, you just have to ignore it. And so it's really nice to like go back and say, like, no, I'm going to I'm going to let that actually affect my decisions um, now. So. Yeah, I was thinking about. Um, so one of the nice things about this book is that it kind of it really simplifies things, simplifies all of the possible decisions that you'd have to make. And it like strips it down so that they aren't really difficult decisions. So like we can talk about, should I have children or not? A really difficult question or how many children I should have. And instead, um, Michael Schur, who's a writer for The Good Places, you mentioned Rebecca, he, um, he goes after questions like, should I return the shopping cart? Um, or should I punch my friend in the face for no reason? Which is really, really a lot easier to kind of wrap your head around and 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 grasp. And I, I really like that about the, this book because then you can kind of apply it in your own life when things get really sticky, right? And I say in the book, which I have to mention, it's just it's a it has so much information, but it's so fun. Like it's just fun. There are footnotes, and I don't know if uh, you guys are familiar with Michael Shore, but he also on The Office played Cousin Moe's. So that should tell you. I mean, come on, this is just the funnest book in the world, um, and also it has so much great information in it. But I love how it said that 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 is the great. How do they put it, Spencer? That's the great. What what indicates your morality? Do you return that shopping cart? I mean, there was a chapter and a half, I think, on that with all the nuances of that. And it's true. You don't have to. No one's watching you. There's so many different ways to think about it. So it just twists your mind up. But you, you've come out really uh, excited on the other side about everything you've learned. Yeah, it's just like I feel like it's one of those books where you kind of going forward, you you don't realize that it's kind of impacting the decisions that you make. But then since we've read it um, again, I've I've looked at you know, there are a lot of decisions where I think, you know what, I, I I take a second pause before I do something. And uh probably what I used to call prompting or something like that, right? Or something, but I think a little bit more about the the decisions that I'm making mostly, and I, I would say that the the thing that has helped the most is that I think more about how my decisions are impacting others. I think that that's the main difference between the decision-making framework that the church provided me as, as, as I was growing up and, and these sort of ethical frameworks from Immanuel Kant, uh, Jeremy Bentham, things like that. It's all about create, you know, thinking about how your decisions are impacting other people. And, you know, they might have different um, views on, on how to evaluate whether your decision is a good one or, or not, but you notice every single one of those involves someone else. Um, 
it, it involves the, you know, the way that you're impacting somebody else's life. So I, I really like that a lot. No, and that's why I thought the trolley question, which maybe you can talk about that a little bit, because that I think stuck with everybody in their mind. You can really see the different ways that they're posing this problem and the different answers. And I, that I think is one of the things that that stuck with most of us uh, after we read the book. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the trolley problem is probably pretty classic problem though. Yeah. I think probably a lot of people know about, but, um, and it's in the, it's in the good place too. They get, they get into that. And in, I think the third season, which is really fun, but the trolley problem just basically says, if you're, a, you see a switch in front of you and you could pull that switch, the trolley right now is about to run over five people that are lying on the tracks. There's no way to get rid of them or pull them away in time. And so you could flip the switch, but if you flip the switch, it's going to go off into another track where one person um, is laying on the track. And at first you think like, this is just a really silly question because first of all, this is never going to happen to me. <laughs> um, hopefully. Right. I mean, that would be awful, but, um, but you can, there are parallels to this, right? Um, how easy is it to, to flip a switch? Well, um, you know, how is easy is it? And I, you know, one of the examples the, the book uses is how easy is it to wear a mask, right? If you could save five lives by wearing a mask, then would you do it, right? Um, and then there are other things, you know, they, they get into, the nice thing about the trolley problem is it gets into all sorts of weird, we, really weird, um, uh, different derivations of it, right? And so like, what if you have, uh, you know, what if you have to push somebody off the edge of a bridge mm. instead of flipping the switch? Like actually do it, actually caught. Yeah, exactly. It, what if you have to be the one to actually yeah. push somebody and actively kill somebody right. in order to uh, save five people's lives? It suddenly changes the equation a little bit because the parallel to that would be what if there's a janitor in the basement of a hospital and you have 10 people upstairs that need organ donations it's like, well, kill one person to save 10. Let's do it. Right. Um, but that's not what we do. Right. <laughs> that's Thankfully, totally not what we do. Yeah, but, you know, it's right. a question to investigate because yes. there are there are ways to look at it where that would be the right thing to do. You know, yes. It's yeah. Like yeah, exactly. Standards that you lay out without taking into consideration other things. That would be exactly what you do. Right. Mathematically, yes. it works out. Which it reminds does. Me, it works I don't out. know. If you if you can go back, I'm sorry that Ted Danza is so funny on the Good Place. Ted, like, he, if you can explain that, it's so funny. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to give it away or anything. No, but Ted, I know Ted Danson in this, it, Ted Danson here is confused. I'll just say about what yeah. the what the but goal I mean, of the trolley problem is. He's thinking, how do I how do I figure out a way to kill all six people <laughs> instead of how because do I he's, a demon, he's a demon on the show. That's why he's yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Oh my God. Uh, so funny. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I don't know what else you guys wanted to talk about or, um, but I love the book. Uh, it was helpful to kind of, you know, you take away. Um, I don't remember who it was that said this, but um I, I remember when I was going through my faith transition, I heard somebody describe it as you have this like worldview, which is scaffolding, like you've built a, an entire structure around your life and a, and a faith transition, a faith crisis can feel like unintentionally, instead of like tearing down a wall and then building a new one, it's like taking a sledgehammer to the entire scaffolding all at once. And then there's nothing left, right? And so you have to sort of rebuild from there. And I thought this was a good book to sort of frame your mind in the right way to try and start building up again from a from a more honestly from a more sound foundation, because, uh, you know, the foundation in the church is presumably Jesus. Uh, and, you know, I guess I would say probably more it's the prophets who represent him. But in either case. Uh, you know, Jesus in the scriptures isn't exactly the soundest, most integral foundation that's provided. And we see that in the scriptures. There are things that he does that are super weird that we would say, no way. Right. Uh, and, and in fact, my believing friends, I would say, no, no, no. I don't want you to become like Heavenly Father in a lot of ways because Heavenly Father is kind of a, a psychopath in some of the things that he does, right? I would rather have you all my the children father. of a nation or yeah. Hard yeah, to, exactly. Whatever. Like I, yeah. you know, I, I just, I think that that's a, um, 
I, I think that we're that in some ways as humans we're we're much better, and so our own intuition can lead to better decisions than this, you know, follow Jesus kind of framework. In my opinion, I think that's a good example because I don't think anyone can read the Old Testament and say I'm good with everything that happened there. We we say why would they do that? And and yes. we struggle with it. There's this struggle where you're going, this doesn't seem right, but you say, well, it's the Bible and God commanded it. So th then, then you're trying to justify a reason for it in your mind to make it work because your mind is telling you this is not right. Th th yes. This behavior is not correct. Yes. And it's so odd to think that the whole goal of all of this is to become more like that being yeah. <laughs> that did those awful, awful things. Uh, I don't know. I don't think, you know, that doesn't seem right to me. Yeah, so. I was on, a, um, I think it was Reddit X Catholic, right? And somebody posted a meme. It was exactly like that. It was all the instances in the Old Testament where it said that you now needed to or had eaten your children, right? There were all the script. I mean, how horrifying, right? It was just trying to list them all out. And there were little graphics by each one. And, and the theme was kind of like, this is this is what you're learning. This is what you're being taught. You know, what, yeah. what the heck? This so is who I, you're I putting on a pedestal. Yeah, exactly. And I don't, I think a lot of people, I mean, certainly in the past, in my generation, we were not really encouraged um, in the LDS church to read the, especially the Old Testament, really. That was not something that we poured over. Do you, I mean, Landon, do you think that's probably true? I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah the church am, but pretty much ignores the Old Testament. Yeah, we ignored it. But of course, now in order to access, you know, interactions with other religions i've been really surprised that my missionary son learning to read the bible inviting people to bible study things like that i just laugh because when i was a teenager and a young adult the bible was kind of a second class you know of the bible it just really wasn't focused on at all so i don't know yeah. it's changing. and with the change that means that people are going to start being exposed to these stories i do have some stories of family members that i probably won't tell um scripture stories that everybody knows that are fairly horrific hearing them for the first time almost and come follow me a couple months ago and asking me, have you heard of this story? And I'm like, everyone's heard of that story, you know, but they hadn't, but now because they have. Because of the Old so Testament. You wonder, yeah. You went in the yeah. old, yeah. You, or no, even the New Testament. Yeah. This was the New Testament. Yeah. Okay. And uh, d this was a story about immorality or too many wives or whatever. I'm not trying to dox any family members or anything, but they just had not heard of these stories that we would consider just kind of foundational stories. And now they're learning them. So it makes me think, huh, maybe they will have to think and make a little bit of a moral judgment on that and ask themselves those questions because it yeah. exists there. Well, one of the things I liked about this book, uh, you had one of the slides there that talked about the topics. And, you know, Rebecca uses these big words because she's a librarian and, mm -hmm. and whatnot. But, <laughs> you know, you got consequentialism, uh, existentialism, and all those big philosophical words. But he explains it so easily that you start you start using them because you now understand what they're talking right. about. And it was really neat to look at the different versions and say, oh, I can see where that would be useful or, boy, I really like that philosophy that that right. really describes the way I the way I behave or the way I think I would choose to behave. And then it had a couple terms in there like happiness pump, you know, that person who does whatever it takes to satisfy somebody, even if it makes them miserable to do it. And you said that resonated. Like, we all know that person. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. we've, we've all been that person, people. probably. Yeah. That's the Relief Society president, right? That so. is. <laughs> no, and I liked how um, so easy to understand the different philosophies and and a lot of them on paper sounded really good until you got into the actual nuts and bolts of how you would enact this. And some of them were insane. Like it would, that would never work in the real world. It worked right. on paper, but so I loved how they were able to clarify that. Right. It, well, it be, because like when I first read like consequentialism, um, at first you think, well, this is just Laban. This is the Laban story. It's yeah. saying, um, you know, let's try and make the most good um, and minimize the bad. And so therefore it, it is justifiable to cut off Laban's head because um, it's better that one man perish than for an entire nation to dwindle in unbelief. That whole rationale is consequentialism in a nutshell, right? And it, something just sat wrong with me about that because I just thought there's just, can't, that just can't be right. It can't be right that you're, and then, you know, the author introduces um, Immanuel Kant and talks about the moral imperative where you say, well, you can't use people as a means to an end. Um, and 
that that one caveat sort of fixes that issue. Um, and so he kind of goes through kind of, you know, like, well, it, it would be a problem if we were all consequentialists because we just go around and like try and like for the greater good, yep. do, do all sorts of things that could be very immoral that sit wrong with us for a reason. And that's because maybe we're using people as a means to an end. And that was Laban, right? He was being used as a means to an end. Completely. Yep. It was all about ah. him. So you mentioned that you, when you introduced the idea of doing the book to book club, you said that you and your wife had read it together. Or is that, tell us a little bit about that. I bet that was really interesting discussions probably and talking about, you know, how to raise kids. That's, I mean, amazing to yeah. read that together. Yeah, it was fun. Um, I think that the biggest reason that we did it is because we love The Office and we liked The Good Place a lot too. And so we thought this might be a fun book to read together. And, um, but yeah, like, I think that like, it was nice to kind of read through and just think about um, a different, it was just like so enlightening and so refreshing to see, um, you know, I had had conversations with people as I was leaving the church who would say things like, uh, you know, there is no such thing as morality, uh, you know, af if there is no God, for example. And to read the hundreds and hundreds of years of work that's been done to explain the natural morality that we're embedded with, right? Whether through evolution or, I don't know why we are this way, but we are this way. It's just, it's nice to kind of read it from a perspective that resonates a little more than saying like, oh, but there's no, there, there is no objective morality without the church, without God. Well, that was, that was existentialism in the book was, you know, that, oh, if there's no God, then everything ends and, and there's no real purpose for being moral. But on the other hand, it was, well, you, then you have to just make the decision for yourself and you have to own the decision. There's no punishment. You won't, you have to own it, whether it's good or bad. And I really liked that idea. I was going, okay, I, I'm making this decision good or bad, not because there's some punishment or some reward at the end. I'm making it because to me, it's the moral or the ethical thing to do. And that's why I'm making the decision. So I right. really, I really related to existentialism uh, as I read it, even though he kind of played it down as, a, you know, a, a more of a dark <laughs> theory. Yeah. Uh, it's I, kind saw, of a I saw a positive to it because I'd never been able to make my own decision and take right. take credit for it. I always just followed what I was told and taught to do. Right. Yeah. I, I remember that you really liked it in our book club meeting. Um, and I think, yeah, it's a little bit of a downer to say like, OK, well, uh, nothing truly matters. Uh, and also we're all going to die. And then if you think nothing matters while you're alive, just wait till you're dead or, you know, a hundred years from now, nobody's going to know my name. And so what's this all about? Right. But then there is this refreshing point, like you said, Landon, it's like, all we have is our decisions. That's all we have that's left for us. And so we can make the decisions that we want to make and, and without any constraints on us in terms of like some pie in the sky reward or um, some authoritarian uh, telling us what the right decision should be, we get to own it. And that in itself is meaningful. Those decisions get to be provide meaning. And so I, I do like that a lot. Yeah, I don't know. Did you like it, Rebecca? I did. And and I also feel sometimes when people sort of wake up, maybe on the other side of Mormonism, um, they sort of go, how did I get here? And maybe others don't have that experience who have been making decision after decision their entire life that they thought about, you know, weighed carefully and then owned. I mean, I think there is a sense that you wake up and I know Landon has talked about this before too, where you just wake up and say, how did, how did I get here? You know, for good or bad. I mean, a lot of times it's, it's great and you don't know what the other decision would have been, but if you're not in control of your decisions, you don't even think you can make a decision, you know, and maybe some people don't understand that. I always talk about my faith journey in that I was never really believing ever, ever since a child but I never knew I could leave or do anything different. And a lot of people don't understand that, but that's an extreme case of not understanding that you can make a decision on your own. And of course I add to that, you know, being raised as a young woman in the 60s, 70s, 80s, you know, you just went with the flow. Um, but yeah, I totally understand that. And and I had a moment that I talk about all the time when I was 55, a couple of years ago, and I just woke up one Sunday morning and said, I don't want to go. I don't want to do it. I'm calling him and I'm telling him I'm not coming back. I mean, it was literally like that where I suddenly yeah. made this decision. I mean, it was really funny because 
in the past, I just really go with the flow. I'm just, you know, whatever, happy life. That's fine. But there was just one moment where I just kind of had this spark and actually made a decision, good, bad, ugly, whatever it was that I owned. And of course, COVID happened right after that. So then, you know, I didn't get credit for <laughs> so my decision matter. because then it <laughs> happened to everybody. But I know that happened to me for yeah. whatever reason that I was suddenly able to make a decision suddenly. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing I kind of like about existentialism, and I don't know if you felt this, either of you felt this way, but, you know, I've, I've since moved on from religion altogether. I don't, I don't have any reason to believe personally in an afterlife, but existentialism is a little bit refreshing. Wherein when I was growing up in the church, I felt debilitated by every decision I had to make because this is the life. This is the, the trial period you know, I remember making this analogy on my mission where I was like, imagine that there's a line that goes on forever this way. It goes on forever this way. And there's this little tiny dot and that's our life. And everything depends on this little dot. So then it like makes it feel like every single decision is going to have these eternal consequences. Yes. So then you throw people into this world where they feel that way. And then you've got really big issues like divorce or, you know, big issues like, you know, should I, should I go on a mission? Shouldn't I go on a mission? Um, what career should I choose? And it just feels like every single decision can be a uh, do or die, have eternal implications. And so existentialism is kind of nice because it says, you know what? 99.99999% of the stuff that you do, probably it's not going to matter. It's the way that I interpret it. And that can kind of, it can sound like a downer, but it kind of is refreshing it's free. because then I can just own it. Yeah. yeah. Well, what's the book that Wendy Nelson wrote? Uh, not even once, or not even once, not even once. <laughs> once, you're, and, and that's Don't how you it. felt. Like I can't make a single mistake because no. perfection is the goal. I can't make a single oh mistake. Oh my gosh! And now you you feel like if I make a mistake, it doesn't really matter. Doesn't I guess I have to deal with the consequences of that mistake, but. I'm not damned forever. I learn and I move on. And you don't right. have to dwell on it forever and worry, is this going to keep you out of the celestial kingdom? Right. And not even once led to, you know, scrupulosity and, you know, OCD. I mean, it's so damaging. It absolutely right. is. And also that whole concept of, you know, the afterlife and basically living for the afterlife, you know, that's also very detrimental too. And in the Mormon Stories Book Club, we are reading... No nonsense Buddhism for beginners. We read secular Buddhism, if you remember, in the book club. And mm -hmm. a lot of that just talked about, you know, being in the moment, being in your life, making your decisions, being present for your decisions, you know, and don't pin everything on something that's going to happen later because right. that's a very difficult way to live. Well, the one of the core principles of Buddhism was impermanence, right? And so it's like there's no whatever decisions you make, it's all you know, you're just, you're just this speck of dust that just for a moment is all congregated into a conscious being. It's not going to last anyway. So you make decisions it's like whatever, you'll die eventually and it'll all work itself out. No, but I love that thought. That's why yeah. I loved our astrophysics um, for people in a hurry that we just mm. read last, last Sunday in book club is because it's the same concept. We're, we're nothing, but that makes us everything individually. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't yeah. know how to explain it exactly, but that's the feeling I get when I re study Buddhism or study the entire vast universe. And I feel, you know, I really am nothing, but I'm yeah. everything. Me. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Did, did, did any of you experience where the church actually made you unethical? For instance, <laughs> uh, you go into a bishop's interview and, you know, oh, man. have oh, you yeah. done this? Have you done that? Do oh, you... I'm a pathological liar. Yeah, I learned yeah. You since got I was used a child. Just, uh... I, yeah. yeah. Nope. I'm no, not I remember not. the first lie I ever told to a bishop. It was at my baptism interview. And the week I've told this story before, but a couple of weeks before I'd held hands with a little boy. I'm like barely eight years old, whatever. But somehow I knew that was wrong. And he asked me, do you feel worthy in every way? And I said, and I knew I was lying. But I weighed the consequences now if I because I, I felt if I told him that I held hands with someone that I would not be allowed to be baptized. So I weighed the consequences in my head. And I said, now, if I tell, uh, you know, it's going to be a nightmare, right? My family, I'm just a little tiny child. And so I said, I'm totally worthy, you know, which I was worthy. But in my mind, I was lying. So you, absolutely. We can do a yeah. whole episode on that, Landon. Just and I think a lot of people feel that way. You learn to just say what you need to say. <laughs> That was one of my last things before I before I went out because I'd been visiting with the bishop, and and uh, 
you know, expressing my concerns. And, and he said, yeah, you can go to the temple, go ahead and go to the temple. And, and uh, you can think through these things. Uh, Cause I thought, well, I, I probably shouldn't have a temple recommend if I don't believe these things. And so uh, that went on for a couple months and then it expired. And so when I went back, uh, I had a niece getting married or a nephew or something. And so I went back to say, well, I want to go to the wedding. So I went back and he said, you know, can you answer any of the questions? Uh, you know, can you say that you know this? And I said, no, I cannot. <laughs> and and it was like, I could have lied. And I, you know, throughout my whole church time, I would, if it, if the consequence was, you know, right. you'd say, no, no, I haven't done that. No, I, it's you know. Even all over again, you'll lie, cut off a head. But it was you know, finally you know. when I, when I when was going out that I finally said, no, I can't believe that. And he said, well, you're not going to get a temple recommend. And I said, I don't want one. I don't want one if I have to say something that I don't believe is true. And I have to act that way. And I went into my son's uh, or ordination and they said, well, you know, you still have the priesthood. You can stand in. And I said, no, I can't. I'm not being honest to myself when I do that. Wow. I know I don't believe that does anything and so therefore I shouldn't be a part of that. And I, and I recuse myself of that. And I felt so much more honest in that case where I'm now not worthy to be in the church or the temple. Uh, but it, it's like, okay, I, I feel better about myself and my decision from that. So it, yeah, I, I think that the biggest one for me, the most common one that I think people will be able to relate to. I actually have a couple from my mission that I don't even want to, I I can't even say it out loud. Uh oh, oh, please do. It'll make our ratings I, go through the roof. No. no, no, it's just awful. I'm kidding. Uh, is Prop 8, right? So like if you voted oh. for Prop 8, the, the only thing that was, that was, that, that was supporting the bigotry that I expressed was just the church's teachings. That was it you remove the church's teachings and immediately like a light switch, it was, it was night and day the way that I felt about the whole issue. Yeah. And so the only thing that was caught that was causing me to do that was to follow the prophet. And I think most people feel that way. I, I mean, there are probably some that don't feel that way, but like, you know, it was, it was literally only the church that caused me to do that. I can say without a doubt that that was it. Um, so yeah, I think that there's weird, like unethical things that exist. And all right, I'll tell you one for my mission. Okay. Oh, I knew he'd cave. <laughs> this is bad. This is confession time. Okay. <laughs> so a man confessed to murdering someone, and because I wanted to reach my baptism goal, I uh, I went ahead and let it slide. I let it. I, I was that was a bad one, right? But it's not your yeah. fault because look at the pressure you're under. To yeah. reach your baptism goal. That's the thing. It's Laban again. Yep. I'm going to yeah, let was... this one man slide so that, you know, we can get our goals. It's the same thing. The question, well, it was the did justification... God authorize it and tell him to do it? <laughs> this <laughs> is it's what okay. I did. So I, you know, I said, well, I'm going to have to, I knew that his family would never get baptized if he didn't get baptized. And I thought, what about their salvation? What about their future in the church? Right. And I said, I'm going to need to pray about this. I went into the other room. I prayed and I prayed and I prayed until I got a confirmation. And when I got a confirmation, which is what I wanted, yes. just a, a, a confirmation, a feeling of peace that, that says, it's fine. Just go ahead and do it. I just went ahead and did it. Wow. So and, and said, yeah, it's fine. You're cleared for baptism. I mean, it's kind of odd because I don't, I don't even know why I was interviewing the person because <laughs> I think we were in a weird area where like we could interview our own investigators. Normally you're not allowed to do that, which is and a then, whole other thing, but yeah. And then the next person came in and they said, I drink a cup of coffee about twice a month. And you said, absolutely not. You are not being baptized. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like it, I was in a mission where it was like, and and I loved my mission president. I still do, but it was, it was very much like your only purpose is to baptize people. And, and honestly, if no matter what they did, it's, that's the, that's what I was taught. Right. And so if, you know, if you, no matter what they did by giving them baptism, you're opening the door to the celestial kingdom for them. And so that's better than the door being closed. And so you might as well just baptize everybody in sight by any means necessary, basically. I can see um, that rationale though. That makes sense. And I, when I you actually agree with and... you. 
Yeah, if you really believe that the atonement is to overcome, if someone did something bad in their past, you can't say, well, you can't improve now because you did something bad in your past. It's, well, we're trying to do something to help this person. That's a good thing. So, Yeah, but I mean, he should probably confess and go to prison, this guy. <laughs> I, well, there is I that little detail. That. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't, I'm yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I'm sure many missionaries have stories very similar to that. I mean, it's yeah, yeah, a crazy world out there. So, well, this has been an amazing discussion. Does anyone have any final thoughts or we will just wrap up? I mean, we could go. This is the problem with book club. We went on and on and on. And that's why we said we got to keep going on. We got to have Spencer on again. And yeah, it's, it's difficult to start talk, stop talking about it because it's just so fascinating and it just resonates especially with being a post-mormon and i mean i think maybe one of my final thoughts is um i think i've seen people wrestle maybe not even so much with their own moral decisions after stepping away from the church but with what to do about their their children maybe like teenage teenage children like is it okay my child is 18 and he wants to take it to the next level with his girlfriend you know my past self would have said, that's next to murder. Don't do that. Here I am on the other side of it. How do I really feel about that? You know, consenting of age, is that okay? So there's, you don't only wrestle with questions for yourself, but how you're raising children, what you think of, you know, friends or neighbors or spouses. It, it really is reinventing your entire framework of how you see things and not yeah. just having the knee jerk reaction. You will not be with your girlfriend, you know, not in my house. And then you think, well, but why, why am I saying that? You know? Right. So I don't know. Uh, that's kind of my experience. And talking. Oh, to I totally agree. Yeah. And my own experience with my own kids too, that you just kind of rework it in your mind and you go, why am I saying that? You know, I really need to think about it. So. Well, my, my final thought would be this. If, if you have left the church and you, uh, are wondering, what do I do with my children? Uh, how do I raise them? Take this book, read it with your children, read it yep. with your spouse, watch the good place together. Just enjoy it as a family and have a discussion about it because yeah. it is it is a fun book. It really makes you think. It really makes you consider how you do, how, how you're going to act and why you act that way and talk about it. It is really fun to talk about. You could talk about it for hours yeah. throwing all these different is this right is this right what if it was this and it, it's just fun so have fun with it that's that was the thing with with this book is it was just a fun book so yeah i totally agree thanks for having me on this is yeah, great it it's was great awesome. to talk with both of you yeah it's really fun you're you know spencer is one of our og book club members i mean he's been with us for a long long they're time. on day one where we, so. where we and, said and there's no such thing as free will come in great when we're oh. tallying up how which books to read he does yep. all the voting and <laughs> we use spencer to create qualtrics we surveys, get graphs. <laughs> yeah, topics and what books we're going to read we're very organized in good <laughs> So, but no, and we're glad, we're excited for your family and everything that's going on with the move. And we're glad that you can still participate with us virtually, no matter where you are. So that's the happy part of it. So, yeah. all right, well, we will say uh, good night for Mormonition. Again, the book is How to Be Perfect, the Correct Answer to Every Moral Question. As Landon said, read it yourself, read it with your family. Um, even, you know, teenagers, uh, probably even tweens would understand the concepts here give it out as a gift to people. I mean, seriously, it's it's just wonderful and gets you thinking and talking. So thank you, everybody. And goodbye from Mormonish. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Mormonish. We really appreciate our listeners and would love to hear from you if you have a story you'd like to share. You can email us at mormonishpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and on our website, mormonishpodcast.org. And don't forget to look for us on YouTube and like and subscribe. Keep joyful, everybody.